Uh, thank you very much for the invite and the introduction, Martin. Um, yes, I just want to talk about um, advances in sinus imaging. I, I work at two different places. Uh, one has equipment which is, hasn't really changed since the Victorian era um, on the left-hand side. Um, the church has gone and the traffic uh, down the road is now slower than it was when there was a horse. And it was entirely free to the poor. That's what it says on there. I don't know why entirely free. I think it just said free to the poor. Um, and the second building is where I also work, which has all the equipment you could possibly want. So it's, it's very interesting. They're about 400 meters apart. So I just want to talk really about three different modalities. I'll leave PET because there's not time, but multi-detector CT, cone beam CT, and MRI. So multi-detected CT is, is the workhorse that you use. And all the time, like your laptop is improving, we're getting increased speed, we're getting higher resolution, and decreased dose for the same image quality or image noise. And as you've seen, you can use it for, it, it's automatic now, you always do multi-planar reformat. You may want 3D CT uh, and, and recons to help you with your complex surgery. And we've talked about surgical navigation already. Uh, and people are starting to use 3D uh, model printing to plan surgery, to build a model of the, uh, of the uh, surgical tumor or the surgical trauma prior to going in and actually operating on the patient. So for example, this patient with a, with a nasal dermoid, um, you can use the combination of, so I'm just trying to work this one out. It's just the red. Oh, yeah. So you can use the combination of 3D to see the, the, the nasal defect. You can use the, thank you, Franz. You can use the um, coronal CT to see the normal anatomy, and you can use the sagittal recon to see where the position of the dermoid is. What about advances? Well, um, in, in multi detector CT. Well, all CT uh, machines used to reconstruct just once, and they called it filtered back projection. And this is a fast, and it can use old CT. But now we use what's called iterative reconstruction. Basically, it means that each image is reviewed multiple times to get out a lot of the noise, to get rid of a lot of the noise. And therefore, you reduce the image noise from the same data. So you can use that either to improve the image quality or reduce the dose. There's another advance in multi-detector CT. We can use two different tubes at 90 degrees to each other. It's called dual source, um, although it's often the process is often now done with a single source. And basically, they fire the X-ray at two different energies. And what does that help? Well, it helps you look at different anatomy. So you can highlight what you want to highlight. So you can highlight compounds based on how dense they are. So you can reduce dental artifact. If you want to see, get rid of calcification to look at a narrowed artery, you can get rid of that. Um, so you can decide um, what you want to view by using this dual energy source. And by doing that, you can again reduce the dose or increase the visibility. So what about in the sinuses? Well, there is another way of reducing the dose, but keeping the same image quality. And this is called spectral imaging. And again, you use that dual source machine that's sending out um, X-rays at different kilovolts energy. And you put a piece of a thin plate of tin in front. It's called pre-filtration. And that reduces the low energy photons that you don't want and therefore reduces the dose. And you balance the increased noise because there's less X-rays going in by increasing the tube current. And you can compare it to a, a fairly low um, uh, image protocol using 25 MA. And basically, they did this and they studied the image noise in the retrobulb of fat, in the air in the sinuses, and in the globe itself. And the quality was comparable in the two groups. And despite already the low dose technique, they could get further dose reduction. And there's the effective dose of the CT sinus study, and there's the background annual radiation dose that you have just walking around. And more, more if you walk around in Cornwall. Um, what about cone beam CT? Um, well, 
there's lots of different machines. Most of them are, are with the patient sitting, although there are supine uh, machines or machines that can go from sitting to supine. So you've got to be very careful. The dose for cone bean, people say cone bean CT is low dose, which depends how you use it. Um, so the dose is very variable for the same study. Uh, they have to have a large field of view. A lot of these machines are used for dental practices. They don't have a large field of view. They're just there to focus on a few teeth or maybe the, the mandibular alveolus or the maxillary alveolus. And you can use different amounts of rotation. You can rotate 360 or just 180. There's high speed, high resolution stuff. There's all different protocols. So you've got to be very careful when people say cone beam CT um, is of a lower dose. It is in the temple bones, but actually, um, in the, in the, compared to multi CT now, I don't think there's any difference in dose. You need a large field of view, and you get you know, similar detail um, slightly better detail possibly on the bone than you would with a conventional multi-detector CT. But for now, using the low-dose multi-detector protocols we should be using, we're not all using, but we should be using, the dose of the two are broadly comparable. The advantages of the conventional multi-detector is it's faster. You can reconstruct faster and you do get some soft tissue. So you can see that nasopharyngeal carcinoma in the patient with nasal obstruction that you think is due to polyps. The device of cone beam CT is, is even higher resolution if you need it. And you can do a very small field of view. Say you wanted to focus on the frontonasal region, you could do a small volume on that, uh, and then that would be a lower dose. What about MRI and dynamic contrast imaging and diffusion weighted imaging. Well, this is a pretty conventional protocol. You have to use three millimeter or less. You go from the tip of the nose to the brainstem on the coronal and above the frontal sinuses to the mandible on the axial. And this is our workhorse that we all use, T1, T2, axial and coronal, sometimes <laughs> sagittal. So this is all known about fat saturation. Uh, but for cyanonasal malignancy, uh, we always use diffusion weighted, and I'll explain why as well. But you should consider volumetric imaging because you can do one sequence and reconstruct in whichever plane you want. You could, should consider surface coil. So if you're just looking at a tumor that's superficial on the nose or going into the orbits and just superficial, you should consider using surface coils to get really super detail. Um, so let's talk about the advantages in cyanonasal imaging. Well, as with CT, ever faster scan times and increasing resolution. And it's a balance. What quality do you want versus the time of the scan? As I said, fat saturated and volume sequences are all well known and you can reconstruct in plain. So I want to talk about a bit about diffusion, dynamic contrast enhancement, and what we call intravoxel incoherent motion, which is a rather long phrase, I realize. So here's the routine uh, CT, uh, MRI sinuses. You've got the T2, you've got the T1, and you can see the vessels and avid enhancement. That's the routine workhorse in this patient with an olfactory uh, neuroblastoma, and you can see it again on the coronal. Here is the tumor, and on the sagittal, and that's well known. And what also is well known is the advantages of MRI over CT for assessing this nasal mass. You can see on this nasal mass, the medial wall of the orbit is eroded, but is the periosteum intact? If you look at the MRI, you see that there's still a dark line of the periosteum intact. Here is another patient just showing you the quality you can get with an angiofibroma post gadolinium. You've got extensive um, extension to the cavernous sinus along the orbital fissure, pterygopalatine fossa, and you get beautiful imaging. And this patient uh, came in twice with the same problem, 45-year-old. Just to show you, you can see the soft tissue, you can see fungal disease. This patient had acute right-sided visual loss. This is T2, um, and it looks clear, that sinus. But if you do the T1, you can see the sinus is completely opacified. And this is fungal disease, which on T2 will look empty. And why has the patient got a, um, a visual loss? Well, basically, there's the optic nerve tra traversing in the middle between the anterior clinoid uh, 
uh, um, and the, in the optico-carotid recess. So it's got a dehiscent wall, and the inflammation of the fungal disease has made the patient temporarily lose their vision. The surgeon went in there, took the anchovy paste out, and the patient's vision uh, returned, and the same thing happened 18 months later. And here's the CT. You can see the bones gone, and you can also see the high attenuation of the fungal disease. But diffusion-weighted imaging, well, it's the it's thermal energy causes diffusion of water, and cellular bar barriers cause restriction. So most tumours demonstrate restriction compared to the adjacent soft tissue or scar tissue. I just want to talk about B values because you'll hear about that. This just reflects the strength and the timing of the magnetic gradient used to produce the diffusion weighted imaging. And the stronger, uh, the higher the B value getting towards 1000, the stronger the diffusion weight. And we use routinely um, a high B value to screen for a residual or recurrent tumour post-treatment. So what is established in the sinuses with diffusion weighting? Well, it's very useful for post-treatment sinus tumour. Is there any residual disease? And it, as it's good at differentiating tumour from post-treatment scar tissue. So here is a patient who had a very delayed diagnosis. This was treated as sarcoid or something for about 18 months. It was a big... Uh, nasal cavity um, squamous cell carcinoma and then the patient had chemo radiotherapy and this was the first scan post chemo radiotherapy and you're looking at it and you're thinking is there a tumor there or not there is obviously some residual soft tissue is it there or not you use the b1000 and there it is restricting you just invert the image and look for the black that's all i do invert the image look for the black and that will guide you back you see that oh yes It'll guide you back. And then they did a PET CT, which confirmed that was tumour there. Biopsy confirmed tumour. So diffusion weighting, you can teach your granny to do this. You just invert it and look for the dark spot on the B1000. And that will help differentiate scar tissue from residual tumour. Is there a role um, uh, for diffusion weighted imaging? This is in the future. For tumour response to chemo radi radiotherapy. So this has not been done in head and neck squamous cancer because that's usually, or malignancy, because you usually operate and give chemo radiotherapy uh, to, to the remaining tumour that is there. But uh, they looked at, at head and neck squamous carcinoma and looked at the, the diffusion after two cycles of treatment, after just two weeks, okay? And they showed that those tumours that were responding to treatment had an increased diff diffusion coefficient at two weeks, and those that had a, a fall in the diffusion coefficient had a 90% failure. So they could use it as a biomarker. Now, it's not yet being used to change the treatment, but I think it will in the future. You do a very early scan as they're going under chemo radiotherapy. This is not in cyanonasal, but in head and neck tumors. And the same with patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Usually in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you give them two cycles of treatment. You then, um, in the UK, do a PET study. And if there's a complete remission, they then change at two cycles to a less toxic treatment. But you can do the same thing with diffusion-weighted imaging, and it's comparable to the PET-CT. So there may be a future there. What about dynamic contrast enhancement? This is a study showing improved performance in differentiating benign from malignant tumours, cyanonasal, using diffusion-weighted and dynamic contrast. So basically, this was nearly 200 patients, so quite a large series. Um, most, uh, most of them were malignant, slightly more than half, and they did this diffusion with those B values, and they scanned every 0 to 2 seconds on the same area, um, and did uh, after, after injection of contrast and did a time intensity curve measuring the peak contrast and the maximum contrast and there are three shaped curves a persistent one, a plateau and a washout and they also measured the region of interest over a centimetre that most avidly enhanced each tumour had to be over a centimetre and all the images were pre-biopsy they looked at the uh, uh, ADC, the diffusion coefficient, and malignant okay, was much, less, um, uh, much lower than benign. So here are two different B values. You can see the benign here, much higher value than the malignant. That's known about. Now, what about the 
curve post-contrast. Well, here's an inverted papilloma, and it shows a persistent curve going higher and higher over time, and intensity is going higher and higher. And this is a classic malignant curve, such as in the lymphoma. You get a, an early peak, and then it slowly washes out. So the conclusion of this paper was that diffusion-weighted imaging alone, using the ADC, was 83.7 accuracy in differentiating benign from malignant. Using the dynamic contrast, looking at the T-peak and the TIC, was 72, so less. But using the two together, they had an accuracy of 87%. So it's still not, um, it's still not enough to replace biopsy, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's sort of a future that you might want to think about. Um, the problem in this paper that they did was that hemangio and fibroangiomas, which they had a few in their series, showed washout, so they looked like a malignant tumour. Um, but And the performance of the diffusion was higher than the contrast enhancement. And the last thing to talk about, just you might hear about this in the future, is called intravoxel incoherent motion. So it's really quantitatively putting a number on the motion that could contribute to the signal that you get with diffusion-weighted imaging. And you divide it into true diffusion of water and, and microcirculation of papillary blood, which should be quite random and go in all directions. So it's called pseudo-diffusion. And if you have the low values, you can talk about perfusion. And if you have high values, you talk about diffusion. And it's better than using a conventional diffusion at differentiating benign from malignant cyanonasal. And it's also been shown to be useful at predicting local control in cyanonasal, those, those tumours that are going to be controlled locally with cyanonasal squamous cell. So overall conclusion, multi-detector CT is similar to cone beam, I think, dose-wise for cyanonasal imaging. CT and MRI ever faster, increased resolution and decreased noise. I think there's a future role of diffusion weighted imaging as a biomarker, maybe to individually tailor the treatment. And I think incoherent, using diffusion weighted with lots more B values, and you can uh, use that, sorry, to predict um, local control. So I'd just like to mention, plug our meeting in September, which will be in London, the European Society of Head and Neck Radiology at the Royal Geographic Society. And, and thank you for listening. This was my last lecture, and he was leaving, so I'm glad you, I'm glad you stayed. Thank you.